Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Writer's Chat. We're so glad to have you all with us, whether you're here today, right now as a recording, or if you're watching the replay. My name is Johnny Alexander. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Brandy Bro and Melissa Stroh. It's good to be back here. I am back in Tulsa instead of Virginia, and I've missed you guys because I've missed the last couple of weeks. Um, we had family reunion time last week, which was really a lot of fun with everybody here. And then um, the week before that, I think I was on deadline and said, I can't be here at the very last minute because, and I needed that time. So thank you guys for the grace of giving it to me because yeah, I was writing until like the very last minute. Um, well, the writer's life. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> here's a little trick I learned, a little tip. No matter how confident you are that you're going to meet a deadline, and I was very confident, very optimistically confident, it was not going to be a problem. It was supposed to be done two weeks earlier than the deadline. Never plan a four-day road trip with grandsons leading up to that deadline because there I was even at the hotel while Jeremy was driving and then staying up late at night trying to finish that because my optimism and confidence were apparently very misplaced. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, lesson learned that we're going to move on and I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who's going to invite uh, to introduce a guest that's familiar to many of you. He's been here before and we just love him. Melissa. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Writer's Chat. And I, as always, just so happy and privileged to be able to introduce our good friend, Britt Mooney, to you. I know he's a returning guest, so some of you are, are familiar with him. But for those who, who may be watching the replay for the first time or joining us here live for the first time, I'll give you a quick little bio of his. Um, Britt believes great stories change the world. So he endeavors to live and tell great stories. A fiction and nonfiction author, he has a passion to teach churches, nonprofits, and business leaders how to leverage their stories to engage and inspire others. He lives on adventure in the Suwannee, Georgia, with his amazing wife, three teens, and a dog. And he's chosen to join us today to talk about the power of story. And we're really excited to hear from you, Britt. So I'll just let you take it away. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, I love being with you guys and I love checking in when I can. It's, it's been an interesting time of transition uh, for me over the last couple months, ever since about March. I've stepped away from, some of you might know, I used to work at a coffee company and I kind of stepped away from that. God's leading me into some different things. And as usual, there's transition and not really... <laughs> knowing all the answers quite yet. I know that might sound familiar to some people. If you've been following God a while, you know how that how that feels. So it's so it's I haven't been able to be here as much as I wanted, but I get to hop on every now and then. And and of course, they asked me if you know what I could talk about. And I said, Well, I've been talking a lot about the power of story with people, I could talk more about that. And they said, Sure. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and so essentially, the reason why I like to talk about this is number one, as an author, I have done a lot of studying, like many of us, about what story is. I, I don't maybe maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but for me, I've done a lot of reading and studying about what story is, and just sort of getting those sort of big ideas in my head. And even when I'm reading, quote unquote secular general market books about story it's like god keeps showing me stuff about you know just about himself about the bible and so and then when i'm reading through the scripture i start seeing certain things happening and so i just want to encourage you, all of us i know all of us are you know believers this is sort of a uh, you know christian ish sort of thing right and and uh, and when we're when we're dealing with telling stories I know we all love to tell stories and we like to tell stories and maybe you feel a calling to tell stories, but God is a storyteller. Like storytelling is from God. This isn't something that is just human made that God uses. People like stories because we were created for stories. We were created to be in a story and God is telling a story. And, and so when we, when we look at the Bible and we look at how, why God tells 
for me, it helps me as a writer, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, to look at my stories and say, am I using these same principles when I'm telling a story, no matter what it is, if it's fiction or nonfiction, am I using some of these principles like God is? Because, and, and part of this is sort of maybe resistance or rebellion on my part, because there's some people out there who say, well, it's okay if you just tell an entertaining story. And, and I'm here to tell you that stories are never just entertaining. There is no such thing as a story that's just entertaining. Yes, they can be funny and we could tell a joke and we could do some things, but at its, at the heart, stories have always have a meaning and a purpose. If a story is funny, there's because there's a truth somewhere in there that makes us go, oh yeah, that's, that's funny because there's a truth that we're, that we're talking about, that we're looking at. So, so I'm going to be looking at what the Bible says about story a little bit and what I've learned about story as sort of like a practical, you know, thing as for us to inspire us. And, and then I'm going to kind of finish out with how do we look at our own stories and try to put some of these things into practice. Okay. So um, you can start. I, Melissa is, she's just waiting on me. I can just see, she's just like, when is he going to tell me to push play? Um, so, um, so first we're going to look at, um, so go ahead and go to that first slide. We're going to look at a, a scripture that, uh, you know, when I tell people about this, they don't believe me. It, it's so funny. Like we all know that Jesus spoke in parables, but, but Matthew, this is in Matthew chapter 13, but it's also in Mark. Mark repeats it, or, or, or Matthew repeats it, depending on how you believe who, who wrote what first. Uh, but they, they both say the same phrase when in the middle of talking about Jesus speaking in parables, they say all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. To the multitude, this is really important. And without a parable, he did not speak to them. In other words, whenever he taught, he told a story that he made up. So whenever he taught, he always used a story that he created, that was creative in some way, that was not a real true story. But when he was teaching about the kingdom of God and the love of the Father, he always used a story every time. He never did it without one. And and then, so that, that's the phrase that both Mark and Matthew bring in to the narrative, but Matthew adds a little bit. Matthew, I'm not going to get into preacher mode about Matthew, but Matthew adds a little bit, and he says, so it might be, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. This He's calling David a prophet, which is interesting, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. In other words, the stories weren't just stories. We, we're, when we tell stories, we are literally telling secrets to the multitude. And when you look at Jesus, he wasn't just telling stories to make it easy for people. He was literally hiding truth. And he, and he says this because his disciples all the time say, Jesus, will you just stop telling stories? Would please just stop it. Uh, just because it's confusing. And, and I, and I want to make this point because when Jesus spoke to the multitude, he didn't lay everything out clearly. He, he hid the truth within stories. And then for those who stuck around, and asked questions and dug a little bit like his disciples, they got the explanations. And I'm saying this to say, you don't have to put all the answers in your stories. In fact, a lot of times Jesus wouldn't tell them the whole thing and he just let them walk away confused. He would just let them walk away confused because part of what we're doing with story, we'll get to this, is to see who wants to know the truth. Who wants to know it? 
because you'll dig and you'll ask the right questions. And so this is part of what Jesus was doing. As much as it might frustrate us, um, this is, and so we'll, we'll get to that later, but this is when we're telling fictional stories or nonfiction, by the way, because Jesus also referred to you know, Moses and he referred to David and he referred to other stories and the, and the other the writers of the New Testament refer to different stories of the of the Old Testament. So they they refer to real stories. They also tell their own stories, right? But we're I'm going to kind of focus on. So there's a lot of storytelling that happens, is my point, in the whole New Testament and the Old Testament. But in this case, we're gonna we're gonna kind of focus on the power of story. Why is this? In other words, he's telling stories to tell us secrets about how the world works. This is how the world works. This is how, this is what reality is really about. That's the kind of stories that Jesus told. And for us as believers, that's what we're called into if we're storytellers, if we're writing stories and we feel called to do this, then we are actually stepping in to a calling of how do we tell stories that tells the secrets of how life really works. This is what life is really about. All right. Um, all right. So I'm going to go through, I think, nine things. All right. So next slide. So why story? Number one. Uh, stories are personal and relational. Stories make friends. Arguments make enemies. I love apologetics. I have a friend of mine. He is a missionary and he's a leader and a pastor and he is getting his doctorate in apologetics and we have the best conversations. I mean, I have I have my MDiv. I have I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I love the intellectual side of that right but arguments make enemies arguments start out with division stories start out with friendship with connection when i want to know somebody and i sit down at a table with somebody to be their friend what do we do we tell stories i don't say well how tall are you okay what's your waist size Okay, I see you're, I mean, like, we don't just tell facts about each other, we tell stories. Why? Because that's how you get to know somebody. That's how you, that's, that's what really matters. You get to find out what really matters to somebody by the stories that they tell. Why are you like this? Oh, well, now that makes sense. You believe this is true because this was your experience, right? So it's relational. We're making friends. When you, you can't argue with the story. You can try to silence a story. I'm not going to get into all that's going on with maybe the sound of freedom. You can try to silence a story, but no one, no one who has a problem with the sound of freedom is arguing that it didn't actually happen. They just don't like the truth that it's trying to share. So they have to try to manage it somehow, right? And which is interesting to me. But so, so that's what stories do. Stories make friends. And, and that's Part of what we're called to do next stories are simple but complex i think i went over this when i talked about the why fantasy and speculative fiction uh why christians get involved in this but theology is complicated theology tries to give us very clear explanations of truth but here's the problem uh theology can't do that uh, in other words i'll give you an example there is a true statement like God is love. That is true. And we should say that. And the Bible says that. And yet the actual love of God cannot be expressed or properly understood in those three words. In other words, human language can't describe God's love, but a story can. In other words, for God to say, God could have just gone, you know, split the sky open and say, I love everybody. That's not what he did. He sent his son to live among us and then to die for us. And then to see what I mean? He told a story. He sent his son to live a story. And those, and that's those, that's, those are the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the stories of who Jesus is and what he did. 
It's and yes, the theology is important, but it's it's placed within a story. Story is complex and can handle infinite truth because it's deep. Right? It can be very simple. A woman lost a coin. There's one sentence. There's a story. Jesus tells a story in one sentence. She loses a coin and then finds it and then comes and tells everybody, let's have a party because I lost my, you know, I found my coin, which is really interesting to me because I think the party probably cost more than the coin, right? But, uh, but he's trying to, he's making a deeper point that we can go into, you know, a, a good, you know, a pastor like me can spend 30 minutes on just that one story. That's a sentence, all the different implications that are going on. So, so that's what we're doing when we're telling stories. Next. Uh, it places things within relatable context. Jesus, I, I, want, I want you to think about how amazing this is. Jesus talked about eternal truth with very common everyday people and things. In other words, it, he didn't talk, I mean, he did. I mean, there was a master and then he would have servants, but he would tell, he would tell parables that use very common everyday life examples. And what that means is, is that we can see truth in things that are very simple and common, common to everyone's experience, and that lifts our everyday experience to something that means something much more. Now our, now our everyday experience can mean something more because we didn't realize that if a man loses, he's got a hundred sheep, but he loses one and he, and, and he goes and he, he does everything he can to go find it. And when he finds it, right, he, he rejoices. Oh, we know, we, you know, we, we see sheep every day. We didn't know this was a spiritual thing, right? We didn't know that God was expressing himself through everyday things. Um, and so, so that's another thing stories do. Next. It transcends and includes both intellect and emotion. All right. So this is, this is big. Uh, by the way, I, I have a book that just came out that goes over a lot of this. Uh, at least one of the chapters does. It's called We Were Reborn for This. And a lot of people have been enjoying it. Um, it's through Bold Vision books. So uh, I've got a whole chapter on the story of God and, and the gospel uh, as a story. And so, but most of us, because of our personality, we, we tend to go towards intellect, the intellectual or the emotional. And most of the times we choose churches with, with pastors or speakers who feed that part of our, our personality, our, either the intellectual or the emotional part of who we are. But, bo but we cannot be ruled by either the intellectual or the emotional. God created those and he wants to use those, but we must submit the intellectual and the emotional to the revelation of God. For God's revelation about himself. We have to submit those things, and that's how our intellect and emotions can be redeemed, and that's what story does. Story puts truth within a, within a story, within a narrative. It's not just intellectual. It's experiential, and yet it's not just emotional, because here's what a story does. I used to do this with my kids. Uh, you know, there's, we all know as writers, there's the dark night of the soul moment in your story. It's, and if it's in a movie, it's about two thirds of the way through, uh, about three fourths of the way through, and all seems lost. And when my kids were little, I would stop the movie, you know, because we'd be watching it on DVD or whatever. And I'd stop it and I go, all right, I guess that's it. I guess, I guess it's over. And my kids would freak out. What are you doing? There's 20 minutes left. That's not the end. And, and so what stories do is stories show us that the story isn't over, that just because we emotionally feel something, we can't be ruled by that emotion because there's some, there might be something else. There might be something, uh, the dawn is coming. There might be redemption happening that we don't know yet, like the character in the story doesn't know yet, right? And so stories place our intellect and emotion, submitting them to experience. Now, number five. Um, we need to know that that other possibilities exist and that because that gives us hope um, when what great stories do 
because most stories, most great stories start with someone who feels stuck, right? Uh, it, that's just this normal storytelling. You, you show where this person is in this place in their life and they generally feel stuck. They might want to, they might want to be stuck there, but they, they, they're, they're in this world and they feel stuck usually. They, they, they hope for something greater, but they, but it seems impossible to them. And then their lives are interrupted, right? The inciting incident, yada, yada, yada. And then their lives are interrupted and then they are taken on a path of challenge and self-discovery where they get to not, where they get to grow to become the person to have the experience they always wanted to have, right? That's a great story. Now, there's a lot of death and mystery and battles and whatever might happen on the way, but that's the arc. And so what story does is stories show us that there's something more than our than how we feel stuck. We feel stuck. And so that gives us hope. And we all know the. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but good fiction has to be believable. I don't know if you've ever heard these good nonfiction has to be unbelievable. In other words, we're not going to write a story about something that really happened if it's just common and everyday things and right. Okay, whatever. Like we all know this is going to happen. But good nonfiction is where it's like this happened and that's unbelievable. i never would have even imagined that this could happen to somebody. We put that stuff in a book and those sell. Why? Because those sort of stories give us hope. He was dead and he was dead for three days and then he rose from the dead. What? <laughs> no way, right? Good nonfiction is unbelievable. And because it gives us hope, it breaks out of this limitation that we live in. Now, good fiction has to be believable to a certain point, right? You have to believe that these characters would do these things in these situations or whatever, uh, because you're already creating, um, you're all, uh, you're always creating something that doesn't exist anyway. So you want to make sure that as fantastical as it is, it's to some degree believable because that's what happens, right? When we, you get to a certain point in a bad movie, you're like, they wouldn't do that. Right. You know, we say that like, no, that wouldn't happen. It's <laughs> somebody's just making it up you know um all right next uh and this kind of goes uh, with the transcends and includes both intellect and emotion a, a story reveals that truth must be lived truth is meaningless as a simple academic pursuit if you're not living it it doesn't matter faith without works is dead and that doesn't mean you're saved by works. What it means is truth. If truth doesn't transform you, what good is it? It doesn't mean anything. Well, we, we can all talk about all sorts of things we might think or believe, but when it comes down to it, truth must be lived. That's the, that's the model by Jesus as he's living something and then he gives us his spirit and grace and faith and all that stuff so that we can live truth and so that's what a story does now if you may not know this but there's two there are only there are basically two types of stories there are comedies and tragedies and this is the the the, the literary definition of these a comedy is at the beginning character believes a lie and by the end, their life is transformed by believing the truth instead of the lie. When, when their lives are confronted by the truth, they now believe the truth. And then their life is transformed for the good. Okay? A tragedy is not just when something bad happens. This is classic literature. A, a tragedy is when the character who believes a lie is confronted with the truth and believes the lie anyway. And their life not only doesn't transform, but it is destroyed by the lie. So a story reveals that when a character is confronted with truth, he or she or they have to now live this truth in order to be transformed. And it shows us that truth must be lived to be real, to have meaning. Okay. Uh, next, number seven, it shows that we're part of a, a bigger connected story. Good stories invite us into bigger stories. We love big stories. Why do we love big stories? There's a great book 
by uh, John Eldridge called Epic. And it's not ironic. It's a little ironic that it's probably the shortest book he ever wrote. It's called Epic and it's really short. You could probably read it in about 10, 15 minutes, but it's all about why we love Lord of the Rings. Why do we love Star Wars? Why do we love these big st epic stories? It's because we were created to be in one. We were created to be in a big story. And so this is what we get with the Bible. God literally gives us a big story, an epic story. It starts with in the beginning, and then it tells us how everything's going to end in Revelation. We literally have it. We have this big story, and, and the invitation of the gospel is you can be part of this big story. And that's the call to adventure and the hero's journey. And I mean, we can, we can look at what the secular quote unquote writers will say about this but that is what the the hero's journey the call to adventure is is when you're called into something bigger you're called away from the life that you feel stuck in and you're called into something bigger and mysterious and something that you didn't even couldn't even imagine before but now you're a part of it so so good stories invite us in to think about a bigger story in our own lives number eight Good stories help make us ask questions. All right, I, 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 I'm not trying to trigger anybody, but one of my main problems with most Christian fiction is they give us the answer. And that's not good storytelling. Good storytelling is you show me the answer and I get to ask questions about why is that the answer. And then when I ask questions about it, and I come to the conclusion myself, I own the answer. It's now, if you just tell me the answer, this is good teaching. I was a, I was a middle school, high school teacher. My wife is a, is a high school teacher. This is good teaching. You, you get the students to discover the answers on their own, then they own it. If it's just, if you just tell them the answer and they regurgitate it, they forget it really quickly. But you never forget things you discover and own for yourself. And this is what Jesus was doing with parables. He, was, he, it's, he wasn't trying to hide it because he didn't love them. He was trying to hide it because he did love them. And the mystery genre is the second biggest money-making genre in the world after romance, and, you know, after guys, you know, shirtless and whatever, like on the covers. But I mean, but after romance is mystery. Why? We love a good mystery. And the Bible gives us great mystery. The Bible talks about the mystery of Christ, the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of marriage, the mystery. There's all these mysteries, and it's in the Proverbs. These are things that, that, that exist, but we don't understand the way of a man who woos a woman and all this stuff. Like there's this mystery about life. And good stories brings us into mystery and admits that these things are mysterious and, and, they're, and you can't just define them and give us easy answers. It's, but it's inviting us to ask the questions. And I'll give you another example from the Bible. The gospel starts out with, well, at least two of them do. Um, the Bible starts out with, uh, there's, a, there, there's a girl, she's about 14, and she's a virgin, and she's engaged, but she's not married yet, but now she's pregnant. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? What does that mean? The Bible doesn't tell us what it means. <laughs> the gospels don't say well here's the theology behind the incarnation and yada it doesn't say anything it just says the holy spirit did it and now go live it and now we're in now we're in a story what's going to happen to this girl what's her what's her fiance going to do what's what what's what's her community going to do oh they can't right now we're in a story and there's conflict and there's mystery and there's and now we get to ask questions so stories don't give us easy answers and by the way this is this is also the problem with a lot of modern progressive influenced media they also it's religious because they they're trying to bring their own beliefs into storytelling and they're not telling good stories they have an agenda with the story which is to preach a message and then people aren't interested and these movies flop. It's not just because of the topic, it's because they're not, they're not getting people to discover truth on their own. And so people are like, eh, this is not interesting to me, right? 
All right. Uh, last one. Last one. Star Wars starts out with a phrase. We can all say it, right? What's the phrase? What is it? Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, whatever it is, right? Within, it's not even a complete sentence. It's got dot, dot, dot. Within that one phrase, George Lucas is transporting us to a different time and a different place. What better, if he can do it with Star Wars, right? And we don't question it. We're in. He gives us a little scrolling thing. There's a rebellion and there's an empire. We don't ask questions. Yet, we're just like, okay, we're cool. This, this dude's a dirt farmer. I don't know what that means. And uh, he's a moisture farmer. And he's transported us to a different planet. He's transported us to a different time. And we don't ask questions about that. We don't say, well, this is stupid. This doesn't really even exist. Like, we're in. It makes billions of dollars. Same thing with Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or what, all these big stories that transport us into different times and places and universes. And we're like, OK, I'm in. What's what's happening? OK, the guy's got three eyes. Cool. Let's do it. And you're like, whatever it might be, we, we're in. So what better? What better avenue can we use to tell people about another world that's not like this one? Than story. So now you know why Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus never gave a definition of the kingdom of God. He never said the kingdom of God is this. He said the kingdom of God is like this. And he would tell a story. Why? Because he's transporting us into another realm with a story. He's telling us about a whole other world that exists that none of them have ever been to. Only he's been to it. And he's like, well, I can't really tell you what it's like because it's so different, but I can tell you what it's like. And we're like, oh, okay, right? This is the kind of things that we do with story. This is the power of what we do. We can literally transport people to different times and places. And within that, it, 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 even if it's a true story about something happened during the Civil War, right? If you tell the story well enough, you, you, you've transported them into the Civil War and, you know, right? 1864 or whatever it is, right? You've transported them to this place. And that's what the Bible does. When I read the Bible, I'm transported to Moses on a mountain meeting with God. I'm there with him in my brain, right? This is the power of story, of power of narrative. And, and, and this is what we get to do. All right. I'm almost done. Uh, and then there's going to be questions. I, I know people have been commenting, but for some reason I have it. I don't have it. Uh, all right. All right. So. So the questions for us, realize you have like a nuclear power when, you're when you tell a story. You literally have so much power when you tell a story. I don't care how derivative it is. I don't care if everyone, you, you, you've been like, hey, everybody's written a mystery or everybody's written a crime and so many people write this, it doesn't matter. When you write a story, you you are doing something you are part of something that's like a nuclear power like this is one of the most powerful things you can do so these are the questions as believers we should ask ourselves how do the stories you tell how do stories we tell reflect the gospel give people hope of transformation and other possibilities and hopefully you heard me when i said this earlier it doesn't mean you tell them you know, the five spiritual laws at the end of the story. How does the story, how do the choices of the characters, good and bad, how, how, how does the world, how does their, the struggle, how, how all these different things that you put within a story, how do those, these things reflect the gospel? Give people hope of transformation, that there's a different, there's, there, there are different possibilities out there. How do your stories invite people to question and discover the truth for themselves? This is a big question, and it's not easy. <laughs> 
But how do your stories, and the secret to this one is in the first one, how do your stories invite people to question and discover the truth for themselves? Because when they own it and they experience it, no one can ever take it away. They can't. That's a gift. How do your stories speak of another better world? How do your stories reflect the idea that there is something else, that there is an unseen realm, that there's a, there's a heaven that's good and real and true? It doesn't mean everything works out at the end of your stories, okay? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's better if they don't. But uh, the whole idea is how do your stories at the end of it make people think, man, there's more to life than I thought was, was real. There's more th than what I see. All right. All right. That's all I got. I was trying, I was trying to leave some time for questions and discussion. Uh, so it's 1139. Uh, and, and I'm sure that um, I'm sure that so maybe somewhere uh i know it's going to be recorded but if you email me at author mb mooney i'll put it in the chat if you if you email me i can send you the the powerpoint if you if you need it if you want to take any notes all right <laughs> questions comments confusions <laughs> it's it's yeah awesome i loved it I, it's the the proverbial fire hose kind of thing only for for deeper thought for me you know it gets you, gets the wheels turning, gets you thinking, how, how does my story or my stories do that? And so, yeah, it's, it's been a real source of inspiration for me today. Thank you for that. Mm. I, since I was screen sharing, I, I missed out on if there were any questions, maybe others have seen some. Not so many questions, a lot of comments of just, um, holding on to what you were saying some of the phrases like you know um trying to find one here I really like it like Randy talked about we don't like things unresolved we were talking about mystery and and, and all of that and Pam said it the Star Trek next generation episode where Picard tells the aliens humans find him irresistible and must solve it yeah, yeah. absolutely um, we can have everybody come on and that way if you have a question or if you have a comment you want to um, make, we can go ahead and do that personally. So why, why don't you hop on and I will make sure anybody put in jail gets taken out of jail. And um, I was trying to think of what other note, I, th I think even just from the very beginning when, when you started out with I, I think Brandy and I both sort of said this in the chat or she said it and I kind of agreed that, you know, you read these Bible verses over and over and over and over and over again, you know, they're not new to us. We have read them. And yet when you said the Matthew verse, it's like, oh, always. Oh, oh, I never caught that before. And then immediately after that, tying that to the Psalms verse, just utter these things. I utter these things in secret. I mean, my heart was just. <laughs> yeah yeah it put it put it in a different context it's like you know you come to scripture and you read it but you don't necessarily read it with an eye on the writing aspect of it and to see it from that perspective and oh jesus taught in the public only in stories well i knew that but oh only in stories and i i just absolutely love the stories make friends arguments make enemies i love it so much i put it on a post-it note it's now on my monitor <laughs> so that's going to stay there forever probably because <laughs> it is so true i mean how often do we talk to people and we you know we it's so easy to get in an argument and you want to tell a point but when you when you bring a story defenses come down because people allow themselves to be absorbed by something else and truths can get in whereas if you're just coming to somebody to discuss something there's always a wallet because somebody is always ready to give the answer for why they believe what they believe right stories get past that excellent I also love the the troubleshooting aspect of it, both as, as the writer and the editor thinking on stories that 
if the story is falling flat, if things aren't working out right, it's probably because you're trying to interject your agenda, your truth through the story rather than letting the reader discover it. And so that's always something to really be mindful of. I've, I've, uh, I know that in my own writing, I've really become more aware of that as the years have gone on and saying, well, sometimes it's not just because I, I lack maybe in dialogue or in some other technical thing. It's because I was trying to interject myself or truth in the story where it needed to be discovered. And I like that. I really, really like that. Well, uh, you know, someone put on here about kids. Uh, Pam talked about, I write for kids. Now I have to figure out how to do this for them. Uh, I'm trying to remember uh, Jesse Florea, I think is his name from, he was, I don't know if he's still with them, but he was, he was with Focus on the Family. And he and I had a discussion about this. And he does things with kids, like the kids stuff with, uh, I forget which kids magazines he deals with. <laughs> but he was talking, we were talking about this. I think, I'm trying to remember the details. You could probably Google it. But it's like kids beginning at the ages of like three or four will pl place them in the position of the character that they're reading about. In other words, it, it starts that early that when you're reading a story, you're placing yourself in that person's position. And, and that is, to me, that's so powerful for, for kids, for me, for everybody, because you're, you're, you, you can place yourself, uh, clubhouse. Thank you. Uh, you can place yourself in other people's shoes. That's what great stories will do. It, it, I, I know uh, there's this whole big thing and I get it. I'm not against it necessarily but to be careful. Like with people like, well, if, if, if the story is about this type of person, then this type of person should write it. Well, they're, they're, oh, I'm not against that. I'm, I'm not trying to, to dismiss people's experience or anything like that. At the same time, one of the powers of writing is that I, I consciously try to put myself in the shoes of another person and ask myself, if I had this experience, what would I do? But that's a power, that's a, that, that expands your, your mind in a way that is, that is compassionate, right? And, and so my point is, is that when you're, when, even when you're writing for kids, like, um, that's why oh, it's not just for kids. It's also, you know, we, none of none of the people in my house, they're all 13 or above. And we sit around and watch Bluey and laugh and love it we love bluey but it's not it's not it is for kids and kids love it but we love it even though we're not four and five because we we can put our we can remember when we were kids but we also put ourselves in the position of the parents and you know see what i mean like there's so many different layers of it that has meaning and it's just good writing it's just good writing when you can do that um so, you know, I, I was just, just thinking about that when somebody talked about the, uh, for kids, about the, even kids put themselves in those sort of positions when they're in their brain, in their imaginations and all that. Pam? Which then puts a lot more responsibility on us children's book authors, knowing that as young as ages three, four, five, they do that. We have to be extra careful now of how we handle our characters, you know, um, because not every kid, most kids say their parents aren't reading this stuff first. You know, it used to be back. I mean, I've read all my, you know, my, my youngest is 30. So, um, but I read all her stuff before I let her read it until she was a certain age. I don't know how many parents do that now. So when there was a character who wasn't so great for her, then we could talk about that and why she didn't want to be like that character. Mm. You know, so that's a big responsibility we have. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking too, with what Britt was saying about, 
you know, the reader doing that, the author, you know, really has to do that too. And, and you might have said this a bit, but I have a little dog that wants to go in and out, in and out, in and out. And <laughs> today he usually isn't like this, so he's distracting me. Um, um, you know, as as an author writing a character, and you and you say, okay, what would I do in this situation? But we're not every character, so yes, our character, this character, we have to think, okay, what would we have to take on the personality and characteristics that we've given a character to say, what would this character do in this situation? And if this right. same situation, what are they going to do different? And I think that that also then what you were saying about empathy that that does something in our hearts to give us, you know, different viewpoints and different perspectives. It's not just our own way of doing it, how we would do it, but it's how different people do it in different situations. So that's kind of a growing maybe thing too. I don't know, just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, they're, they, uh, and, and a big part of this, and we, and you've all heard this, right? That we no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Like if <clears throat> if it's not moving you when you write it, the story. I'm talking about the story. Like if it does, if, if if as you're writing it, it's not moving you and it's not affecting you as you're writing it. It probably won't connect with some readers, and I, it may not connect with most, but. But, you know, when we put these universal themes, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm a I'm a fantasy guy or science fiction and all that stuff. Uh, but it happens in all sorts of stories. But I'm thinking of Tolkien, right? Tolkien was absolutely a Christian, you know, and, and he spoke to C.S. Lewis to yeah. help C.S. Lewis kind of explore what it meant to be a Christian. And, and he was part of that journey from C.S. Lewis converting back into faith but there's no there's nothing in there's no like clear representation of the gospel in the lord of the rings but it's one of the most christian things i've ever read man if you really read this thing at the end of the fellowship of the ring the the real battle at the end of the first book is the struggle uh, within frodo whether or not he's going to take the power of the ring for himself because the theme of five, right? The theme of of uh, of of the whole series of the whole three books, which is really one book. But the theme of the whole book is power over others is wrong, and destructive. That's really that's the simple theme. And so, what's the? But he shows us the battle that has to happen in in, in with within Frodo's own heart. And, and and he just keeps showing us these things over and over and over and over, and it's and and what it means to make decisions out of freedom and not to control others, and it's just so beautiful. It's like, oh my gosh, this is, and and so you get it to the end, and and in the movies, definitely. Um, I mean, I remember one time watching. My son was maybe eight or ten, and we were watching the end of the Return of the King where Frodo is saying goodbye to, you know, and we, and he was crying. He didn't, he didn't know what was going on. He's crying and I'm crying. And it's like, you know, but that's, but it's because we've gone on this journey with them and it meant something to us. And, and man, I, I just think that's such a powerful thing. And you're right. It does put responsibility on me to ask the right questions. What, what am I saying with this? You know, um so yeah yeah that ending even before that when they're in the it's at the ending but he's in the in the home Frodo's in the home and he starts doing that you know narrative voiceover thing that gets me every time and I just <laughs> I just weep <laughs> you, yeah. you, know, like, you know all he's gone through and yeah he's well he they succeeded in their quest he didn't necessarily personally succeed but they succeeded yeah and he bears the scars of that and they are not going to go away you know and mm -hmm. yeah yep okay i'm getting teary-eyed just thinking about it so <laughs> 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 oh gosh anyone else have anything they want to 
ask about or have clarified or talk to you? Um, um, my challenge is wanting to put more of the Bible truth into my stories, but not to actually put the Bible verses in, you know, like not to be preachy, mm -hmm. but to incorporate it. And that's been a struggle for me because I've seen authors slip it in and I was like, oh, there's that verse, you know, like you said, oh, there's that verse again. Um, but I want those readers that may not be reading the Bible because there's a lot of people not reading the Bible um, to see those words. So it's, it's hard because you want the truth in there. Mm. You can't be preachy because it, then you lose people. Um, so that's my challenge when I write. Well, you have to think about who your main audience is. And even if you're hoping that someone who's not a Christian is going to read the book, that person may not be your target reader. And you have to write to your target reader. And so you have to decide who that person is. Is it the uh, someone who's seeking answers? Is it someone who already has a strong faith and is going to recognize what verse you're you're putting in there without you actually, you know, spelling it out. And then think of everyone. I, I mean, that may sound a little harsh, but that is just the reality of it. That's the reality in your marketing. That's the reality in pitching to a publisher who, who, you, what publishers you might pitch to. You, you just have to know that and let that help guide you as far as mm -hmm. how, I don't know how to say this exactly. How, how, preachy you can be because i would i will tell you um uh, christian fiction readers don't want preachy they know it they just want a good story and they don't want characters praying all the time necessarily because they just want to know the story i mean you know so you just have to be careful with with that kind of thing they just they just want a, a story and lots of times they want something that's just you know, that they like it because it's not gratuitous sex, it's not gratuitous violence, it's not gratuitous language, and, and that's what they're looking for. So, you know, there's going to be a message in there for sure. You can't get away from that as, as an author. You can't. But, um, you know, you just have to really pinpoint who your target reader is and write to that person. Well, and, and again, again, I'm not, a, I'm not against putting a Bible verse in a story, especially if you know, you, if you know your audience is necessarily Christian, but most of us would rather read a story where the person reads the, okay, so in the hero's journey, there's the call to adventure, and the formula is that they reject the call first. Mm -hmm. That's the formula. Now, I'm not saying you should follow a formula. I'm just saying that's the formula. Frodo didn't want to go. He wanted to give the ring to, you know, Gandalf. No, you take it. I'm, 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 I'm nobody. I'm, you know, Luke Skywalker. I, okay, I'll take you to Anchorhead, or well, I, I can't. I, I got, I got to be the dirt farmer. I can't just leave my aunt and uncle. Right? There's always the rejection of truth first, because that's reality. That's everyone's experience. We've all rejected truth, and so whatever the Bible verse might be. It's going to be more real if the character rejects it first <laughs> and fails first mm. and then has to learn to live the truth in spite of him or herself and learn through the failures and learn through the rejections and learn through these things because that's that's been my maybe you guys are perfect and you've done everything God's <laughs> ever told you to do. But that's not been my experience. <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> have had to learn the hard way. <laughs> and, and my point is when you, when you let your characters, when you, you know, what do they say about you put your character up a tree in the beginning of the book and then you start throwing rocks at them. Like when, when you, when, when you start doing this stuff to your characters, it's got to mean something. And then, and so put the Bible verse in there, but don't make it, make it something that they struggle with, that they fail at. And then even a Christian reader will go, yep, that's me too. That's and that's what you want. You want those moments of me too. Yeah, I fail all the time. I failed last week at that or whatever. And and yet the truth wins. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. in the end. In the end, the truth will win one way or the other. And like the comedy and the tragedy, the truth is going to win. <laughs> That's just the way it is. But you want, it, it, when you put your characters through those sort of arcs, then the reader will also go through that and say, well, then maybe I can risk living by that truth too, you know, <laughs> or try one more time. If they failed and tried, one, you know, I'll see, you see what I mean? Like all those sort of conversations that are going on. So yes, it's not, it's not about not putting the Bible verse in. It's just how do you do it in a way that tells a good story and, and makes people realize that they can overcome their own failures and their own weaknesses and their own, all that stuff. And then to that take sense, yeah. make it even a little bit harder is that as Christians, we know that we pray and we know God answers prayers, but in your, in your novel, you can't have that be the, be what happens because that's cheating. I mean, it's like, you can't have what, what's the phrase deuce ex machina or something like that. Deuce ex machina. Yeah, the God in the machine. Yes. Yeah. You can't just have this, like, you can't have a lot of coincidences. You can't have just, oh, you know, I prayed and and then everything was hunky-dory fine. I mean, that can't be what happens, even though we know that those things sometimes do happen in real life. You've got, that's cheating. So, yeah, it, it can be a, a bit of a, of a challenge. <laughs> well, but again, the Bible is honest about the same things. Jesus shows up having resurrected and beaten death and he still has the scars. Yeah. You just, and you just, and you just said, well, wait a minute. Yes. Frodo lived through it, <laughs> but guess what? Um, he's never going to be the same. Mm-hmm. Yes. He, he survived. And yes, he gets to go to the undying lands at the end but he still carries those scars and the bible says you know i I think we'll all still carry the stories and the scars it doesn't mean we'll be sad necessarily but um but those are the kind of things that that make it real if you if everything just there's i'm not gonna give give it away which ones but there are a couple of christian movies where like everything works out at the end and i'm like whatever like that never has never happened to me I mean, I'm not saying that good stuff hasn't happened to me. I'm just saying like that, that sort of like, woohoo. Uh, <laughs> Meat little bows are not believable in fiction and, and yeah. most of the time. <laughs> um, but character growth is believable. And uh, so those are just some hints about stuff I have to do. I mean, as I'm looking at how I do it. And then, of course, when you get that feedback from people who are like, man, when this happened, I cried in the book. And you're like, okay, well, I cried too when I wrote it, but obviously you got what I was saying, right? Obviously you got what I was feeling with the characters and their struggle and what they had to overcome. And um, yeah, <laughs> Pam Pam Halter was, was, was raising her hand. I saw that she was- uh, I was just in that. agreement there. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Doesn't take much to make me cry, but- you know, I just, but yeah, it, when, when you, when people give you a feedback of when I read that, you know, and I wept and I'm like, yep, feel you. Yeah. <laughs> I had a so, friend I, years ago said about scars. Um, she said, scars are sacred because they show you where you were and what God brought you out of. And that she, when she looks at her own arms, cause they're all scarred up from when she was cutting, when she was a teenager, mm-hmm that he saved my life. She said, I look at my scars and I don't want to hide them because they're sacred. So. Yep. Uh, somebody was mentioning Alan Arnold. Yeah. And, uh, and he's a, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, and he, uh, he, it was so kind. He, he, he said he, he, he endorsed the book that I mentioned early, earlier. Um, so yeah, he and I had, have had some amazing conversations over, over the years. Yeah. Um, definitely. It's being t- yeah. The Eden option. Mm, yeah. Really nice. Nice little book. Yeah. It is a great little book. All right. Well, it's a little after the top of the hour, so we need to wrap things up. Britt, we just want to really thank you again for such an inspiring, yeah, very inspiring message. We appreciate that so, so much. Uh, Melissa, do you 
have what we're doing next week. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm looking from screens to screens and forgetting to unmute myself. I've got my oh. son mowing the lawn outside and it goes by the window every now and again. So I did, didn't want that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, next week um, we are going to be joined by uh, Maggie Wallam Rowe. And she's going to be talking to us about publicity for writers. Oh, so, so we're gonna we're gonna be jumping from the power of story to marketing your story. <laughs> it, it's a it's a big shift, but I think it's gonna be gonna be really fun to learn and hear from her. I know she's taught at um, several conferences and and uh, some has been re recommended to us by members of the writers chat group. So I hope that that you'll join us. And look forward to sharing that. All right, so we hope you come back next week for that. Um, if you're watching the replay, we do invite you to join our Writers Chat members group, our Writers Chat Facebook page, where you can see all of our videos, um, past episodes, also on the YouTube channel, Serious Writer YouTube channel. That's where we post our videos. And uh, we invite you to be here with us when we record almost every Tuesday morning out of the year at 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Central, and so forth. Uh, we're so glad for those of you who are here with us, especially week after week. And um, we just really love our writing community and pray for you guys and just want to, to bring you the best episodes possible to encourage you in your writing journeys. Britt, thank you once again. And... Everyone is welcome to stay for the after party. Bye-bye.